It was just a couple weeks ago that I had a chance to talk to all the teenagers in the room over there. And I said, you know what, some of you older teenagers need to take some of these younger teenagers under your wing and start singing with them. And uh, because we had a group of older teenagers that were loving to sing and doing all that stuff. And some of them have abandoned us, you know, and gone to college and or got married or whatever. And, uh, and I said, you need to grab some of these younger ones. And I told the younger ones, it's time to step up to the plate. And uh, you know what? That's the only thing I said to him. And I don't know if you've noticed over the past a couple of services, young men getting up here singing, young ladies getting up, and, and we're not twisting their arm. Amen. A lot. <laughs> you know, maybe just a little bit. No, we're not twisting their arm to do that. They have a desire. And I certainly appreciate some of these older teenagers saying, hey, let's, let's pass it down to the next group. And uh, that's a blessing. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs in chapter number 4. Proverbs in chapter number four, we have been dealing with this idea of how do you take these great spiritual uh, concepts, uh, walking in fellowship with God and, and, and getting to know him and being filled with the spirit, how do you take some of these spiritual concepts that we've been talking about and put them down in such a way so that they affect us every single day? So that they're not theory, and they're not so daunting that uh, it is perceived that only a great theologian could actually practice these things. Can I, can I tell you, that's not the plan of the Bible for the walk and fellowship with God to be practiced by a few, but by every believer to walk in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Okay? And that we might walk in the light as he is in the light. And so we've gone kind of through this process to establish some things. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. And if you remember that word commit means to go to the edge and roll over and just head on down. It's, it's a surrender. It is God, a blank sheet of paper. I am yours. You fill in the blanks. I commit my ways unto you. And once that commitment, not, not a testing of to see if the water is hot or to see if the water is cold, but you know how it was. I remember when I was a kid, you, you didn't want to go test the water. You just wanted to run and jump in. That was the best way to get acclimated to the water. It was far worse if you tried to go in slowly over time. And you would shiver. It would be miserable. You might as well just jump in. Okay? You're eventually going to get all wet anyway, they would say. Jump in. Get your head underwater. Well, that's what God said. Commit thy works unto the Lord. That word commit means to roll Roll over, come to the edge of the hill and roll over, and then God will establish your thoughts. Don't be surprised if God does not establish your thoughts until you commit your way unto the Lord. So many people are saying, what does God want me to do with my life? Or how does God want me to live? How does God want me to operate? And God's saying, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to establish your thoughts until you commit to me. Okay? It's very important. That when you sign for, uh, sign for money, they don't give you the money until you sign, okay? They don't give you access to the money until you sign. Well, let me just use some of the money and then if it works out, I'll sign the papers. That's not the way it works. You sign, then they give you use of the money. Hey, listen, you commit your ways unto the Lord. God, I'm a, I'm a, my, my life is a blank sheet before you. I'm giving you permission to fill in the blanks. I want you to determine my course and establish my steps. And he not only gives you direct, but he establishes your very thinking about life. So many people are confused about their thinking because they've never committed their works. So the Bible says, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Then the Bible told us in Proverbs 15, verse number 22, and let me just read that to you, and then we'll get to, the, to Proverbs 4. Uh, 50, verse 15 and verse number 22, it says this, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Without counselors, uh, purposes are disappointed. Intent, without intentionality, without the ability to declare and determine what you're going to do, and that comes via being fed the right information and being accountable to the right people, then that establishes the very purpose of your heart. Man, I want my thoughts to be established by God. Commit thy works unto the Lord. I want my purposes, God's purposes in my life, to be, to be, uh, to be accomplished. Well, then th that's going to be done through, uh, through uh, counselors. And the Bible says, with good advice, make war. 
Okay? And so there's going to be, there's going to be purpose. You say, well, preacher, does that mean that, that everything's going to go the way I want it to? No, no, it doesn't mean everything's going to go the way you want it to, but it does mean even in the storm that your life will line up with the purpose that God has for it. That God will accomplish his purpose in your life. Because a lot of our lives is dependent upon that other person. I would never get angry in traffic if everybody drove the way they're supposed to. Okay? I would never get angry. But people don't drive the way they're supposed to, do they? Okay? So I, I'm probably the one that's driving, that's making you angry. But uh, listen, it's important to, to have counsel, know what good wisdom is. And that, that comes from having God's word given to us and then having a, a holding ourselves accountable to that to establish our purpose. You say, okay, I want to do that, but the problem is that oftentimes I find myself uh, failing. Well, we looked at that last week. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, uh, 16, For the just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. That word to rise up again means to be reestablished, to be established again. And the just man falleth seven times. But if his eyes are on the Lord and his trust is in God, Psalm 20 told us, and we lift up our banners before God, he will reestablish. Aren't you glad that God does not throw you away the first time you mess up? Yes. Amen. Or the second? Amen. Or the third? Or the fourth? Does that mean that it's not possible that there is, there is damage that comes from the fall? Oh, certainly there is damage that comes from the fall. That's the whole reason to, to be reestablished, to be established again. It is a necessity. There is damage that comes with the fall, but praise the Lord, the just man rises up again. He continues. That's what it told us in Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Okay? They are fallen, but we rise up again. Okay? And so we, we want to continue. It's not about perfection. Ultimately, it's about direction. And God reestablishes the just man. So we're going to come tonight to Proverbs uh, in chapter number 4. And we're going to begin in verse number 20. Uh, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's word, honor the word of God. The Bible says this, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life both unto those that find them and health unto all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee forward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at your word. And uh, Lord, we're looking at uh, those, those practical things, how the incredible concepts of, of Christianity and a, a spirit-filled life and fellowship with you uh, translate to everyday living. Lord, may we, may we commit our way unto you so that you'll establish our thoughts. Lord, may we have good counsel according to your word and that is true and right according to your word so our purposes will not be disappointed. Lord, may we recognize that though we fall as just men, we can rise again and be reestablished. Lord, we can, we can look to the future instead of being so concerned and consumed with the past because you will establish the just man, but the wicked will find his life continually in mischief. Lord, and even as we think about this idea of being honest with ourselves about ourselves. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be willing to let you do a work in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Self-confrontation is probably the hardest thing. Some of us have no problem with confronting others and have no problem with being having a critical spirit towards other people, either, either openly or quietly. But uh, sometimes we are uh, less inclined to be truly critical of ourselves. Uh, we, are, we are fans of ourselves. We enjoy ourselves, okay? Uh, but in order to be honest, sometimes a little self-analysis is necessary. Sometimes a little self-confrontation is necessary. Sometimes it's obvious. You wake up in the morning, you walk into the bathroom, you look in the mirror, 
there's not a lot of searching going on for self-criticism. It is perhaps fairly evident uh, because the effects of the night's sleep, your hair's all messed up like mine, you know, and just, you need to put some water on your face. You no doubt you need to brush your teeth. You know, it becomes very obvious that there needs to be some improvement to your life. Uh, and you would do that for the sake of yourself and for the sake of others, hopefully. Hey, if you just walked out of the house, you got up out of bed and walked out of the house, uh, it could be, um, it could affect your reputation. Okay? And so we do a little self-confrontation. We look in the mirror and then we use the skills and the tools that are given to us to change ourselves, right? Whether it be a razor or hairspray or comb or lots of other stuff that may be on, on the bathroom counter, whatever it is. And you do a little self-confrontation. We understand that physically, but can I tell you, spiritually there needs to be some self-confrontation as well. And God's word explains it so uh, in such detail here, even, even though we see this in Proverbs 4, we almost see a young man as he begins to begin the course of his life, uh, though it is, you, you, it is directional in the sense that he is determining the course of his life, it's also continual that that self-confrontation is needed more than one time. How silly it would be for you on a Friday when somebody looked at you with a strange look and they said, are you okay? You look a little out of sorts. Well, I don't know, I comb my hair on Monday. I brushed my teeth on Monday. I took a shower on Monday and now it's Friday. You know, I charted my course for the week. I started out well. You know, I, I adjusted those things that needed to be adjusted and I, and I, and I made myself pre presented the way I want to present. Listen, it's continual, isn't it? You have to go back to the process over and over again. And thus it is also spiritual. Hey, preacher, I charted my course January 1. I made my New Year's resolution and I said, I'm going to serve God this year. Hey, it's continual, the necessity of that confrontation, that self-confrontation. The information is needed to be uh, given. It says in verse number 20, it says, My son, attend to the words, incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. And so the, the word, the wisdom of God continually needs to be imparted to us. Do you think this is the first time that he had given these sayings to his son? No, we're in chapter number four. You read chapter number one, chapter number two, chapter number three, all the way through chapter number nine. It will be rep re repeated over and over. Incline thine ear. Lean thine ear. Listen to what I am saying. Remember what I am saying. Establish to what I am saying. Incline thine eyes. Incline thine ear. Incline thine heart. It will be repeated over and over and over and over. And even you get all the way to chapter number seven and the young man is still simple. And he has observed that his way leads to destruction. And so it is, the, the information needs to be re continually repeated. Can I just tell you, it is a misnomer to think that there are Christians that do not need to hear the preaching of God's word. Man, we need the preaching of God's word. We need to be confronted by it. We need to be comforted by it. Okay? We need it continually to be given to us. And so God's word is, is extended. And then the, the decision, verse number 11, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all the flesh. And it says, keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And so we're talking about those purposes. We're talking about those desires and, and, and the goals. And, and it's gonna be a matter of the heart. He says, keep your heart with all diligence. What is the desire of your heart? I want to serve God. I want to please God. I want to obey God. I want to honor God. I want to praise God. Hey, that is the desire of my heart. He says, you're going to need to keep that. And then he's going to give us some direction that is necessary in order to keep the desires of our heart. Because the, you say it's, it's all about the internal. It's not about the external. Well, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So a lot of times we can get an insight to, the, to where a person's heart is by the conduct of their lips, by the kind of things that they say, okay? By, by what comes out of their mouth and whether they're able to, to control that tongue. When they, when they fail to control that tongue, it is not a tongue issue, it is a heart issue. And so he says, I want you to keep it. So yes, the inside, God starts from the inside out 
But oftentimes the outside is an indicator of what's in the heart. Whether it become from what comes out of our mouth. And he'll, he'll let us know that. Look what it says. It says, um, keep thine heart with all diligence, verse 23. For out of it are the issues of life. Connection to the mouth. Put away from thee a forward mouth. And a perverse lips put far from thee. He says, listen, you need to keep your heart with all diligence. And it's important to know that your heart's connected to your mouth. And it's, what's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth, but it's important for you to be intentional to determine what comes out of your mouth because it's a reflection of your heart. Sir. What, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What's more important, the heart or the mouth? Well, they, they are connected. And so as I want to keep keep my heart in all diligence that I want to be determining, I want to be purposeful and saying, I don't want this to come out of my mouth. I don't want blessings and cursings to come out of my mouth. I don't want to be out of control of my tongue. I don't want to be swift to anger. I want to be, I want to be careful. So I'm going to, by choice, put this away because I know that kind of speaking, that kind of uh, attitude does not match the heart that I desire. In order to keep my heart, I separate myself from particular activities. So he says, put away those things. Then he says in verse number 25, let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. I, I, I get this idea. He says, listen, I've given you the word, incline your ear unto it and let it, let it create in you a heart. God's word creates in you a heart. You surrender your heart to it and it, you set your eyes to the desire to accomplish what God has put into your heart. He says, look straight on. Don't be, don't be distracted by those things that are around you. Look to the author and finisher of your faith. Okay? Look to the prize that is before us. And, and so you see that connection. I don't want my mouth to affect my heart or deviate my heart. And I want my eyes to continue to be look on the prize. I want my eyes to continue to look at what the desire that God has created in me. And so then, then there's this nuance. It's kind of interesting. It says this in verse Number 26, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Listen, your eyes are important to determine a goal, but your eyes will never get you to the goal. You know what's going to take you to the goal? Your feet. You can look anywhere you want. And he says, look straight ahead. Make your eye attached with your heart to reach your goal and your mouth be purposeful so that it matches your heart. He, he says, do this with your eyes. Do this with your mouth. And then he says, ponder your feet. Ponder your feet. It's, it's, sometimes it's very easy to determine a person angry or happy or sad by what comes out of their mouth, right? You're not normally confused. When you're looking, it's pretty clear what you're looking at. But when you're talking about your feet, your feet are, are, are less inclined to determine the ultimate goal. They determine the very next step. And I come down here to this, to this floor and I say, man, God's will for my life is to go through this path. That is God's will for my life. I, man, I really want to go through that path. My mouth matches it. My eyes match it. But guess where my feet are going? My feet are going another direction. My feet are turned away from, uh, from the, what God wants me to do. And I have a desire. I have a hope. I communicate that with my mouth. And so I'm going to take a little, one little step. Oh, man, look at this. I'm, ooh, I still want to. See, I'm looking. I, I see it. And God says, I want you to look to it. I want you to have that desire. I want you to put those things from your mouth that would, uh, that would affect your heart negatively. Put those things aside. But then he says, ponder Ponder where your feet are pointed, so to speak. Because it's not one step to the door, is it? It's a lot of steps to the door. And your eyes are not going to take you to the door. Your feet are going to take you to the door. And so we got to be, we got to be self-confrontating. We have to confront, uh, confrontate. We have to confront ourselves so that we're able to ponder the path of our feet because it may be necessary that we change the course of our feet and he says, you ponder it, so what? So that your ways will be established. Your course will be established. 
Your path will be established so that your activity of your life will match the desire of your heart. Have you ever had your activity of your life not match the desire of your heart? Have you ever corrected your children and the correction of your children did not match your heart for your children? Okay, I, I'm the only one. Yeah. Where I have, I have a heart for my children. I have a desire for my children. I have a, a hope and a dream for my children. My eyes look way off into the future and, and looks all the way to, to who they marry and looks all the way to what God will do for them and the blessings of God and, and God's will for their life. Man, my eyes look way beyond, but right now they're annoying me like crazy. And sometimes my actions in this moment doesn't match up with my heart and desire for them. I promise you, if you were to know my very heart and look at my, at my heart for my children, you would not find annoyance. You would find love, compassion, future, hope, dreams. That's what I want for them. I'm looking. But sometimes my feet don't line up with my heart. And I don't notice it because I don't step all the way into their future, do I? I don't, one bad step does not all of a sudden 10 years take. I take one step, but can you imagine if God's will for, for my life or God's will for my children's life is to, to go through a particular door, to go through a particular path, I see it, but my activities, because I am, I am blinded to the consequences of moment-by-moment -moment activity, or I'm blinded to the consequences of a lack of a little self-confrontation so that I am careful to let God order my steps, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and, I, and though I have a, a desire for it and a hope for it, constantly, day after day, I'm taking little steps and little steps and little steps that are not taking me towards the will of God for my life or my children's life. They're taking me away from the will of God. And the whole way, can I tell you what I'm telling you, what my desire is? That they would know the will of God. That good would be accomplished in their life. But I'm not pondering my feet so that my ways are established and my feet do not match the desire of my heart. Now here's what the Bible says. If you look what it says in, the, in our verse, it says, ponder thy feet. Ponder, it says in verse number, uh, verse 26, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Can I, can I help you with this, this illustration that, that uh, Solomon is using? Okay, we, we are so, sometimes we are so over uh, consumed with the, with the overall picture. But this way he says, you have a desire, the information's been given, you, you know what it is, you, you, you're going to keep your heart with all diligence. He said, there's one thing that's going to trip you up. Your eyes see it, you're, you're, you're careful with your mouth to avoid things that would detect from, or detach from, uh, deflect from it. And he says, you see, you know what the desire is? He said, but you need to ponder. That, the idea means to consider, to confront. What is the path? What is the path of my feet? Not only what is the, the activity of my feet at this moment, but what is the direction? What is the ultimate goal of my feet if I continue down this way? And when I'm able to confront myself over the path of the activity of my feet, and don't be surprised if the direction you're going, the road you're headed down, that's the road you end up on. Don't be surprised if the direction you're headed is the direction you keep on going. And we constantly, listen, I, I'm guilty of this. I, I am guilty. I was just talking to my wife not long ago about this. I, I often have particular desires and hopes and dreams. And I go, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. But if my, the, my path of my feet are not pondered and, and considered, I very easily can have a claim in my mouth and even a desire in my heart, but not a change in my direction. And it gets down to the nitty gritty. Because he didn't say, change thy path. He doesn't say, your direction, you know what he says? Remove thy foot from evil. This is the implication. It doesn't say stop going. It, it says that step right there. 
that one's the wrong step. That, that step, remove thy foot. It doesn't even say remove thy feet. You talk about being confrontating to ourselves, to confront ourselves, that we would know where, the, where our path is headed, and we're finding ourselves, listen, that's where I'm going. So it's not about, it's not about changing the goal, because to be honest, the guy that takes the drink doesn't have the goal of being a drunk, right? That's not his goal. The teenager that goes 70 miles an hour down the neighborhood street doesn't have the goal to getting into a wreck and killing somebody. You know where their eyes are? Their eyes are over here. Whether it's a little bit of fun or whatever disillusion, desire, or hope they have, their eyes are this way, but guess where their feet are faced? Their feet are faced this way. But the solution, you don't tell the guy that's picking up the, the, the alcohol for the first time, you don't tell him, don't be a drunk. You don't tell him that. Because you know what he's going to say? I'm not. You, know, you, you say, remove thy foot. Don't do that step. That step is going to lead you down a path. And that step is going to produce transgression in your heart and in your life. And the way of the transgressor is hard. You say, preacher, unfortunately, I've already gone down that path for a while. Aren't you glad that God can take you out of the miry clay and set your feet back on solid rock? He can chart your course anew. Though there may be consequences from sin, though there may be rebel in your life, you're never beyond the ability of God to establish your goings and establish your ways. But here's the problem that we often have. When we get ourselves in this position where we have a desire, we have a hope, whatever it is, whether it's for our children, our, our marriage, our, our church, our ministry, no matter what it is, we have a desire, we have a hope, we have a dream, and our eyes see it, and, and, and it would be a good dream, but our, the, the feet of our path are, are deviated, our, the paths of our feet are cockeyed according to where we're supposed to be going, and instead of pondering the paths of our feet, we blame everybody else for making us point the wrong direction. Well, it's not my fault. He turned me this way. It's not my fault. She turned me this way. It's not my fault. My parents turned me this way. It's not my fault. That person turned me this way. Listen, there are bad people in this world. And they do bad things, but they doesn't stop us from having the grace of God in our life to where we can establish our own feet. And I don't want anybody's activity in my life to stop me from letting God establish my ways. And that comes from me pondering my own path of my own feet. Amen. No matter my surroundings and no matter the people that exist in my life. Because it doesn't matter the excuse that we would give. And can I just be frank? Some of them are pretty good. Some of the reasons that our feet has turned in our path, they're pretty good. I don't care how good your reason is, if your desire is that way and your feet are that way, which way you're going to end up? You're going to go the way your feet are pointed. That's just all there is to it. You're going to go do it. Even you have a different desire in your eye than you do with your feet. And sometimes we go, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And it doesn't take much for but, but a single person's activity or, or some sort of uh, criticism or, or, or some sort of uh, struggle or some sort of harsh word or, or whether it's a struggle in life or a financial issue or I, I don't know what it is, but something comes in our life and we feel that it is an excuse enough for our, the moment, whether we think we're just going to detour, we lie to ourselves. I'm not going to go the wrong way. I'm just going to step the wrong way around the obstacle. And a lot of times, in the midst of that detour, our feet get pointed off the wrong direction and we never get back on track. Why? Because we don't ponder. We don't consider the paths of our feet. To counsel or confront ourselves when it comes to our own activity and be willing to say, no, no, I know what my desire is, but my feet are pointing in the wrong direction. If I were to illustrate this to you in the life of a young person, 
you probably could see it better because you, you watch how their life, it, you, you know and I know young people that have grown up in church that, can I just be honest with you, in knowing them, they have a genuine desire to serve the Lord. They have a genuine desire to serve the Lord. But because of giving in to surroundings or giving in to appetites or giving in to, to those things that will be around them, uh, they, whether they understand it or not, and, and they may be confused by it, uh, they, they begin living their life as they get a little bit older and their desire is this way, but their feet are that way. And we meet them about here. And we still think, perhaps, hey, this is going to line up. This is going to be okay. And they think it's going to be okay. And they get married about here. And it's, everything's still going to be okay, isn't it? And we fast forward 10 years in their life. And their life is nothing what they planned or hoped or wanted. And they're confused. Yeah, but my desire was... Desire gets you nowhere. Obedience is the path that you can travel. Hey, it's a beautiful thing when you ponder the paths of your feet and God establishes your path so it matches your desire. You know what happens when your paths are established and your desire are based upon the paths established by God? You know what God does? He gives you the desires of your heart. He gives them to you. What a gracious God. Why, why does the God does not do that for me? Why has God not accomplished that in my life? Well, maybe you need to ponder the path of your feet. Yeah, but preacher, I'm so much better than that person. It doesn't say ponder the path of your neighbor's feet. It doesn't say ponder the path of anybody else's feet, but ponder the path of your feet. And thy way shall be established. And here's what's going to happen. When you ponder the path of your feet, God is clearly going to show you what to do and what not to do. He's going to say, I'm going to take you and I'm going to line you up. Now, don't go to the right and don't go to the left. And when are we supposed to recalculate? Remove thy foot from evil. But we, we sometimes do not think that we as American blessed Christians need to depend upon God moment by moment. That everything's going to turn out okay. Everything doesn't always turn out okay. Even if we have hopes and dreams and desires. Because it's very easy to mess up your feet. I was using a golf illustration this morning and why not have be two for two? It's amazing sometimes you stand beside some, behind somebody that's golfing and you watch them line up to golf and their feet will be pointed in a particular direction. And they go and they hit the ball and wouldn't you know it, the ball goes where the feet are pointed. And they're upset and they're checking their grip and they're checking the club. It's this club. I know it's this club. I got it on a yard sale. You know, and they're throwing it or breaking it and you're like, listen, I can tell you what the problem is. Okay? Or more likely, they're telling me. <laughs> I can tell you what the problem is. The ball went right where you were aiming. Yeah, but I didn't notice it. Why? Because you know where my eyes were? On the fairway. Headed towards the green, friend. I didn't want to go in the trees or the rough. I want to be headed towards the fairway. But wouldn't you know, it doesn't matter how much I desire it, the ball is going to match the path of my feet. And just like life, I can have my eyes up, looking at good things and right things, but if my activity in this moment is such that is not according, has not been established by God, has not been confirmed by God's word, I'm headed down the wrong path. And I'm going to find myself not ending up where God, where my own desires want to be. Nobody stands at the wedding altar. Nobody that I've ever met stands at the wedding altar and watches their bride walk down and says, I wonder how long it'll be till we get divorced. Nobody stands at the delivery room 
and watches that new baby boy or that new baby girl come into the world and say, I wonder how long it'll be till they break my heart. I wonder how long it'll be until they become rebellious against God. Nobody starts a business and say, I wonder how long it'll be till we go belly up. Nobody starts a ministry and says, I wonder how long it'll be till I get bitter. Nobody joins a church and says, I wonder how long it'll be till I hate half the people here. Nobody does that. Everybody has a desire, but sometimes your feet do not match your desire. And God says, listen, I want you to ponder them. Can I help you with that? That, that? that means sometimes things may not be quite as clear as you think they are. In my own self-justification, things are not as clear as, and guess, who's, guess who needs to change? My feet need to change. My feet need to change. Well, preacher, it is that person. Listen, this, it is a misnomer. Christians, we believe that we have the right to be offended. Here's what you have the right to do. Honor and serve and praise Almighty God. Amen. That's what you have the right to do. And sometimes, bad things that have happened to us have caused our feet to get off the path. I promise you, it wasn't God that offended you. I promise you, it wasn't God that brought that into your life in the sense of the result or consequences of sin. And so you ponder your... But how often do we do that? How often do we ponder our activity? I wonder when it comes to our feet, where we are going, I wonder if we ponder our responses to people. I wonder if we ponder our, our methodology of life. I wonder if we ponder our activity or our direction. Maybe as a Christian, sometimes we need to get up in the morning and look in the mirror. I don't mean the physical mirror. I mean the Word of God mirror. And let God establish, us, establish some things in our life. This is so dangerous. Let me give you this and I'll close. This is so dangerous for young people. Because young people are always looking to the future. Are they not? You can ask some of the older folks in here. The future and their feet are a lot closer together. I'm just being honest. The future and their feet are a lot closer together. Each step is more understood because you're closer to the future. You have experience and wisdom and you understand how one step can re re result consequences and result a path. And so there's wisdom in that hoary head, the Bible says, and there's a experience in that because you've gone down some wrong paths and by God's grace, he's had to correct you. But here, this is less about the correction of God in your life and more about yielding to the Spirit of God in your life to avoid the need of correction. Listen, if you go down the wrong path, God's going to correct you and put you back on the right path. But wouldn't you, don't you enjoy the fact that he says, ponder your own feet. You can avoid the difficulty, not because I, 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 I chasten you, but because you line your feet up according to my word. And when your feet don't match my word, you change your step. And young people are looking so far into the future. Hopes and dreams. I promise you, if you ask every young person that I know in this room, they would say they have a desire to serve God and please God with their life. But I wonder where their feet are pointed. That's what I wonder. Where are their feet pointed? And we see them in such a good light. They're, they have such a desire. We see them like, praise the Lord. You know what's more important than where they're at now? is where their feet are taking them. And those appetites that they have not corrected, those activities that they have not put in check. Do you know that the, 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 the statistics would tell us that eight out of 10 children that are sitting in this room will not be in church when they're 25. Eight out of 10 is what the statistics would say across what they would deem Bible-believing churches, according to the, those people that do that sort of stuff. Eight out of ten. You're like, how in the world does that happen? We know those kids. Those kids, they're going to do great. Yeah. Their eyes see it. But their feet are pointed the wrong direction. 
Ponder the path of your feet, and thy ways shall be established. You want to make sure you don't miss out on the will of God, young person, old person, middle-aged person. You want to make sure you don't miss out on the way of God? Let God establish your ways. Let God establish your ways. I promise you, if he establishes your ways and you keep your eyes where they're supposed to be headed and you don't deviate from the left to the right, you will accomplish everything that God wants you to accomplish. Yeah, but I'm not perfect. Hey, praise the Lord, the just man falleth seven times, but rises up again. He gets back in place. But even before I fall, God says here, as soon as you take that step, remove thy foot from evil. Don't justify it. Don't minimize it. Don't mitigate it. You go, oh, oh, my feet don't line up with God's word. Guilty. I'm asking God to convict me sooner about sin. That's what I'm asking God to do. Convict me sooner. Be careful. Because <laughs> it's amazing how quickly God will convict over sin that we don't even really think is sin yet. It's just oversight. It's just oops. It's just, I meant to. It's just, I forgot. But you know what it could be? One step to change a direction, to affect a life. Ponder the path of your feet. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would be obedient to you. Lord, that we would be willing to ponder which way our feet are pointed. Lord, we know what our desire is. We would hope and desire for an abundant life. We would hope and desire for spiritual success, for a ministry that is pleasing. We would have our hopes and desires. Lord, but our desires will not take us down the path that you want us to go. Only obedient steps, each step at a time. Lord, may our feet match our desires so that you will be able to give us the desires of our heart. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together and turn to him.